Hello, welcome back. We're in a uh, beautiful woodland area, just right off a park. And decided to come out and do some painting today. It's a beautiful sunny day. It's getting to be uh, toward mid-May. It's still very cool for this time of year, but We're doing okay. Just like in the sky conditions, we have perfectly blue skies. Almost perfectly blue. There is some uh, little clouds coming in here and there, but hopefully it doesn't cloud up too much. At least let let me get this painting finished. Just want to uh, thank you for watching and. Hope you find this informative. Right now I'm just uh, blocking things in for a composition. I think my horizon line is going to be a little higher, right about there. And I just want to get some basic lines in right now to uh, kind of give me an idea of where things are going to go compositionally. And while we're getting started here, let me tell you my colors. Titanium white, cadmium yellow, I'm sorry, cadmium lemon, cadmium yellow light, cadmium orange, yellow ochre, transparent red oxide. That's very close to burnt sienna. This is Venetian red. This is um, from my studio. I just grabbed these paints and slapped them on my Pache box here before I headed out, trying to uh, conserve paint. This is cadmium red. Uh, the Venetian red, by the way, I don't know if I'm going to use that at all. We'll see. Uh, cadmium red, alizarin crimson, ultramarine blue, cobalt blue, cerulean blue, viridian, and chromium green oxide. And in case you're wondering, I usually use pretty much the same colors in the studio that I use when I'm out painting. Sometimes I might switch one or two out depending on my needs. But I don't have a outdoor palette per se versus a studio palette. And if you're uh, new to this channel, if you could do me a favor and hit the subscribe button below. It helps me to keep making these videos. I have camera equipment invested in this. Um, video editing equipment. Some audio equipment though. I just got a new camera recently and I'm hoping I can just record straight into the uh, camera audio versus having to create a separate audio track and then putting it back together in the studio that's or back at home. That's kind of a pain. Save me a little bit of time on editing. But anyway, uh, hit the subscribe button. That'd be awesome if you could. And um, also, if you like what you're seeing, hit the like button. You don't have to do it yet if you're new. Maybe you won't like this at all. Hopefully you will, but... I think I'm... I don't know how many other plein air artists are doing full videos that are not time-lapsed. I don't see a whole lot out there, but I'm sure they're out there. So 
So I'm gonna use a paper towel. It's just kind of rubbing a tone. I know I'm kind of destroying a lot of what I put in already, but there's a, I'm rubbing in a rub, a warmish tone. And I do have an idea. Basically everything I put in so far, it's just to give me a mental picture of what I need. It's not something that's totally necessary. But getting to this warmer tone with this transparent red oxide um, helps to kill the very warm yellowish green ambient light that is hitting this canvas as I paint. Let's just go with that too. I don't always do it with the paper towel, but I just decided to today for the heck of it. So now that we've thoroughly destroyed what I started, let's rebuild it. Um, I think one of the big draws of this painting is going to be this tree right here in the shadow area, this tree. So let's get that in first. That's probably my darkest dark in this scene. And I like to identify the darkest dark first. By the way, if you're wondering what this color is, that's actually just some paint I mixed in the studio for another painting. Um, I think it's like, I'm gonna use some of it actually. It's actually probably ultramarine blue, alizarin permanent, and titanium white. And I just had it left over from another painting. And sometimes I'll save those colors instead of getting rid of them. I try to uh, conserve color as much as possible in an intelligent way. And what I mean by that is when you're painting, when you're actually painting, you don't want to be thinking so much about conserving color like to the point where you're too timid to use the paint to make a good painting. And a lot of artists, what they'll do is they'll squeeze out just a little tiny amount and they'll try to do this huge painting from that small amount of paint. And you can't paint with any kind of serious freedom or confidence when you do that. There's better ways to conserve paint and one of them is when you're done painting, when you have leftover paint, I like to freeze it. I actually have an article on my blog, which is mysketchjournal.com, where I talk about how I store my unused paint. And if you want to go check that out, I've got a lot of articles on there that I think you'll find helpful. Finish watching the video first. Uh, that makes YouTube happy. YouTube doesn't like it when I send people out of YouTube. But um, I have a link below in the description to my blog so you don't have to worry about having to write it down or miss it or something like that. But Anyway, when I'm actually in the process of painting, I don't worry about conserving paint. I use as much as it takes to get the results that I want. So now what I'm doing is I'm just reestablishing these uh, darks that I kind of lost. I like to get the darks in and build off them from dark to light. That works well with oil paint. I don't do it every single time, but I do it most of the time.
once you get the darks in, you can get a pretty good idea of where things are going and if it's going to work out well or not. At least from a compositional perspective, as well as values too. Values are arguably the most important aspect of color. And so if you can get your values correct, then there's a much greater chance your painting is going to work out. There are other, other things about color that you have to get correct and be mindful of. There's hue, there's chroma, or intensity, and basically what those are is just how hue, of course, is whether it's green or blue or red. And you could also call it uh, temperature, whether it's warm or cool. And intensity is just how grayed down or how pure the color is. When I look at the actual scene that I'm painting, I um, try to always squint at it, especially when you're dealing with this complex foliage. That helps to uh, simplify everything so you can paint faster. And the, uh, there's a lot of bright stuff going on in here, but I'm going to um, make it a little bit darker than what I'm seeing it. I'm going to paint over with some darker colors, and then I can put the bright stuff on top. But if I leave that area white and I put that bright stuff on, I have a tendency, this is my own personal quirk, especially with these intense spring greens, I have a tendency to paint those bright areas a little too bright and pure and it just looks gaudy at the end. Greens are very tricky but there are ways of, um, of dealing with them. My way of dealing with them is just kind of tone them down, neutralize them to a certain degree and then build up the intensity as I see needed. These greens down here on the ground are a little bit cooler and lighter than the uh, greens here, which is to be expected because that follows John F. Carlson's principle of angles and consequent values.
And what I really want at this point is the relationships between this and this and that to look correct. These have to be a little bit darker than this is here. I don't have to match the color or even the value of this exactly as long as I match the lightness and darkness between these two masses and I get the degree of lightness and darkness between these two correct or at least convincing then my painting can be a little bit darker than the scene or a little bit lighter it can be a little warmer a little cooler as long as the relationships between the overall masses are correct. And at this point, I try to keep the paint fairly thin so that if I do need to make adjustments to these masses, it's uh, easy to do so. Those of you who have watched my other videos have heard me say that quite a bit. I used to get obsessed about technique and about, um, you know, all get thick paint down or get thin paint down and that, that stuff doesn't really matter. It can look nice, but it doesn't make a good painting. Nor does the size of your painting. I recently had a uh, person comment on one of my recent videos and then comment on another video and said something to the degree that they thought it'd be nice if I painted larger. Not sure why it matters because even if I paint it really big it's still going to show up the same size on the video screen but um, and they said something about me giving me advice to put my use bigger brushes uh, and as if I wouldn't have that part figured out um, after 20 some years of doing this and then they told me to uh, put my body into it, whatever that means. <laughs> it's like try to do dance moves or John Travolta or something, but the uh, reason why I tend to paint smaller out here is because it's a lot quicker, first of all, to see the overall relationships in my painting, and it's a lot quicker to capture it. And I don't, uh, I'm not worried about impressing people with the size of my painting. I'm just worried about being able to capture the relationships correctly. I've done bigger plein air paintings, but it doesn't really mean you're going to have a better painting just because it's big. It's kind of, um, it's, a, it's a bit naive uh, thinking. I remember, I can't remember his name offhand, but a Russian artist who, uh, he lived in the early 20th century, he did some uh, phenomenal, a phenomenal painting of some aspens, and apparently that painting is very small. You, you think in an image it's big, but it's a, I've been told it's a very small painting, but it's just incredible. And some other artists, master artists like uh, Scott, well, um, Matt Smith, he's one of my favorite landscape artists, he paints very small, relatively speaking. And so, paint with the size that you're comfortable with. Don't paint... I, I've had a number of artists, you know, I go outside and I paint really big in plein air and I'm all that in the bag of chips because of it. And then I see their paintings and it's like, well... Uh, I would suggest you go smaller and paint something that looks good versus bigger and something that doesn't look good. It's 
So don't worry about what other people think when it comes to the size of your painting. Paint in the size you're comfortable with and the size that allows you to capture the, um, the scene in the way that you want to capture it. There's no award for doing something really big. And there's nothing wrong with doing something small. Like I said, I'm, I'm comfortable painting this size for a number of reasons. First of all, because I can capture the light a lot faster because this light's constantly moving. I mean, this shadow right here is already sh shifted. So I'm, a co I'm more comfortable painting the size plus and doing a video for YouTube. You know, you guys, if I did like a three hour video, you'd probably fall asleep. And the light would be changed so much, I'd have to come back out again. And I've done all that stuff, but I'm painting smaller with plein air. And I'm liking it. So that, at the end of the day, that's what really matters. What do you want to do? I mean, learn how to do it well, but you may, you be the decision maker. I um, studied under Scott Christensen, one of the world's top landscape artists, and um, he paints really big in the studio, but when he goes out plein air painting, he paints small, um, very small in some cases. And I remember when we were taking his class, you know, we, we all had to go out and do some plein air painting and come back in and have him critique it. And I remember him walking around the studio and we were doing eight by tens, six by eights, maybe a nine by 12. And I remember somebody had like a 12 by 16 and Scott said, who the heck is painting the murals here? Um, he did not want, believe in painting real big outside just cause you're not gonna capture things like you should. And Scott, he's, he's one of the best, him and Matt Smith. And they paint small outside. Then I also know some artists, planner artists, who are paint big and they're phenomenal. Um, one that I know, uh, really great guys, uh, Tim Bell. He lives on the eastern shore of Maryland, and uh, he paints these skipjack scenes. Skipjacks are a type of boat, for those of you who might not know. I didn't know until I started hanging out down there a number of years ago. But he paints these skipjack scenes, and he, he can like pretty much make them out of his head. He's so familiar with that subject. But um, got some glare there from my palette knife. But he'll, he'll crank out like a 24 by 36 in a couple hours. And it's phenomenal how he does it. It's just incredible. I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't do that. But he's also got an incredibly loose style. It's a beautiful style, but it's very, very loose. And so that doing it that size and that quick works for his style. It just does not work for mine.
I know Emil Gruppe was a uh, advocate of painting large outside too, but he, uh, like Tim Bell, has a uh, very had a very loose style. So at this point I have quite a bit of the um, foliage here blocked in and the relationships look pretty good. And even though the foliage back here, it appears very bright in the photo and in life, um, I'm not going to paint it that bright. I'm going to make it try to keep it a little bit darker than the ground plane just because it just looks better and it's going to uh, maintain that whole idea of angles and consequent values. See like right here, these highlights, I put those in a little too bright. sunlight out here is really intense. It's almost hard to see what I'm painting in a somewhat accurate manner. Okay, so I got my palette cleaned off, replenished my Viridian. 
I want to go in and really uh, hit this tree here from a figurative perspective, of course. So just want to strengthen some of the darks. This is definitely the darkest area in the painting. actually trying a different color combination for the color of the trees. I used um, alizarin crimson and chromium green oxide. It's not bad but I st still think I need some viridium because the chromium green oxide is very opaque and it's a lighter color and I want to keep this value Kind of a strong dark, not terribly strong. Uh, this is the importance of squinting because when I open my eyes and I look into this area of the tree, there's a lot of um, little highlight things going on with the pattern of the, of the bark. And if I keep just staring in this area, and I've talked about this in past videos, if I keep staring in just that area, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna start painting all these little uh, light areas and I'm gonna make them too light in comparison with everything else and it's gonna ruin the painting. It's gonna ruin the value masses of the painting. Value masses are so important. Um, I'd, I'd rather have correct value and lose some of that detail than the other way around. Now, a lot of artists, uh, more novice artists and even experienced ones um, who, just because they haven't been trained well, or they, you know, they don't know any better, or they just don't care, they choose to paint that way, detail's more important to them, whatever. A lot of artists will, um, you know, ignore the value masses and totally destroy them for the sake of putting in detail. And, you know, they do that because they think detail is more realist, realistic, and I totally disagree. I think that correct value masses are going to give you more realism than lots of detail will. Because getting correct value masses gives you the effect of light. And the effect of light, whether you have detail in or not, is going to make that painting look a lot more realistic. That's uh, kind of my personal philosophy, if you will. Now, some people might disagree with me, yell at me in the comments section, whatever, but too bad. That's, that's how I look at it. Um, and as I said before, you know, they're entitled to their view. Um, and that's great. That's what makes, uh, you know, art different. And I don't mean that as a criticism against anybody who is real into uh, detail. But all I'm saying is that the more you break up these value masses, the less effect of light you're going to have in your painting. And to me, that just kills the realism that your painting could have had. Some kind of recreational vehicle prowling around up the hill from me.
You get a lot of curious people when you do this. Or you can get a lot of curious people, let's just put it that way. And by the way, if you're interested, um, I say this in all my videos, but I do live online painting workshops. Do it through Zoom, we meet every Saturday, and I take you through a painting step-by-step -step over a four-week period of time. Sessions are about two hours. And they're all recorded, which is nice because for those who can't make the sessions, they can watch the recording later. And I, we paint a lot slower than this. We also paint bigger too sometimes, actually a lot of times. But, um, so the paint bigger crowd would be happy to hear that. But, um, Anyway, uh, I take you through step by step, show you, tell you exactly what colors I'm mixing, why, and the whole theory behind it. I also do the painting on my own outside of the live class because it's a little different painting on your own versus trying to paint with the live class and let everybody keep up. Oh, we got little cloud cover here. Sometimes I like these moments because it lets me see the painting from a uh, different lighting perspective. Kind of gets rid of that ambient light too that I don't like or that makes it challenging, shall we say. But anyway, like I said, live sessions. Um, I critique your painting either during the session or you can email it to me afterwards and get feedback on it. And it's a lot of fun. We have a fun group. Most of my students are repeats. A lot of them have been with me since I started. But, you know, some do um, discontinue for, usually it's for scheduling purposes or sometimes medical reasons, things like that. But if you're interested in studying under me, um, you can click on the link below and that'll take you to a page where you can sign up on a waiting list and when a spot is open I let you know and then it's first come first serve. The reason why we have a waiting list I know a lot of people do that to get you excited and it's a mental thing and all that but I have to have a waiting list because you don't want to jump in in the middle of the month when we're halfway through with the painting and you know it's it's uh, you, you miss out on a lot of those classes so on the on the ability to do the live classes and plus I try to keep um, the attendance try to keep it down to a minimum you know on the classes so that, uh, or a certain number, I should say limited number, so that I can give more uh, personalized attention to the students. If I have too many students, then I can't um, give you guys the attention you want or need on your, on your paintings and you know, feedback and everything. So we keep the class size uh, limited.
But what's great is that when you do sign up on the uh, membership platform, you get immediate access to all past recordings. Going back, I, I started doing this um, at the beginning of the year, and you get instant access to the recordings of all sessions going back to February of this year. And so you can, and those are you know different paintings that we'll be working on that month, but you can, you can just watch those if you wanted to. And you're not required to show up to the live classes, but that is an option. And the value is pretty darn good. You're not gonna find this much instruction and access to uh, this kind of stuff in too many other places. And the, the price you're paying, you know, is at least right now, when I'm recording this, you know, my prices might go up in the future. So if you're watching this like five years from now, um, if I'm still doing it by then, depending, you never know what will happen, but uh, the prices right now are probably cheaper than if you were to go take just piano lessons from any average piano teacher out there, music lessons. I used to be a musician, I used to teach music, so I know a little bit about that too. Especially when you consider the instant access to all the uh, other um, videos and recordings. So uh, go check it out. Love to have you there. We take all levels. Um, you know, the beginners, they struggle a little bit more, but that's because they're beginners. But I have a few beginners in there and they've been with me for several months now and they like it because a lot of people, I've heard, I've heard people say, well, I'm just gonna do it on my own and I think it's best if I just paint on my own for a while. And well, you definitely want to paint on your own. There's, there's no doubt about it. Um, the one thing that is limited with classes and with teaching and instruction is that I can't give you my experience. I, I mean, I can tell you, I can give you my knowledge, but I can't give you my own personal painting experience. And that, that can't be replaced by any classroom. So you want to do that. However, if you combine experience with good knowledge, and good training, you're going to um, you're going to advance a lot faster. I didn't do it that way. I I started out before there was online classes like this, and I I just painted on my own, painted from life as much as possible, which is one of the best things you can do. But because I didn't have the training or knowledge, it was really hard for me to figure out where I was screwing up and I was screwing up big time still screw up but anyway the uh, the solo road you can definitely take it but you're gonna be on that road a lot longer than if you get some good instruction and you know whether it's for me or somebody else you know doesn't you know it, I don't say it doesn't matter. There are some teachers out there who are not that great. You get some even well-known teachers that don't really teach. They just want you to be happy with having the pleasure of studying or taking a class with Big Shot so-and-so. And they'll come around and just kind of go, oh yeah, a little bit of red there, that's good. And then they move on. And I try to give you a lot more than that. But anyway, enough about that. If you're interested, click on the link below. OK, 
Okay, so this gets a little tricky in here with the way the light is hitting these leaves. The sun is you know, al almost straight up and right behind right behind here, like up, you know, very high in the sky, but the scene is mostly backlit and it's tricky to paint the this foliage jettisoning out. If you put the highlights on, it kind of blends it right into the background. Sometimes you just have to uh, kind of leave that stuff out and just focus on making something that's going to read well. Don't feel like you have to replicate everything out here. That's not the purpose of doing this. Okay, this tree has this nice little highlight. Let's see if I can get that in in a convincing way. There. For me, that highlight kind of made the painting. It's always something when you, you know, you're working on the painting and it's not, doesn't seem to be happening the way you want it to, and then you just get something in there and just bam, it all falls together. I love it when that happens. It doesn't happen always, but when it does, it's great. Further back, there's these trees here that are quite cool in the shadow areas. A little too cool. My text messages going off on my phone had somebody complain about that. 
in the comment section. <laughs> Sorry about that, but I need to kind of have my phone by me. I have a family and I like to be available in case they really need me. And family comes first, so. And if I silence my phone, I won't hear it ring. Not sure if I like that, but that, that curves there, but I'll leave it in for now. Running out of uh, transparent red oxide, might have to uh, replenish that here soon. Now this I put in, it was a little too dark. So just want to lighten it a bit. When I look back at these trees that are further back, if I look back at them by themselves, they will seem to be very dark in value, but when you compare them with this, they shouldn't be nearly as dark. Because if you make them too dark, you're going to bring them forward and it's not gonna look right. The darkest dark should be right in here. And even this, I need to lighten these darks a little bit. They're just too much. I want to go a little more red with these highlights back here. I don't want these highlights to be too strong. I don't want them to compete with the highlights here, but they need to be there for sure. And this is a good lesson as far as um, color temperature is concerned. Now, warm light will produce uh, warm warmth on the uh, illuminated side whatever is illuminated by warm light is going to have you know a warm illuminated side to it and the shadow side by comparison is going to appear cooler and so with these trees you know the part that's picking up the sunlight it's got to be warm and the shadows have to be cool now You have the same thing going on here, but I don't want to use the same warmth, if you will, the same color temperature of warmth to illuminate the sunlit side of both of these. Um, the orange is arguably, in my opinion, the warmest color on the palette. Blue is the coolest. Now you can get a whole thing about white, as Richard Schmidt talked about technically being the uh, coolest color on the palette. Um, and that's fine, but I'm talking actual color. White is really a neutral. So, so as far as actual color, white is the, uh, or I'm sorry, blue is the coolest color on your palette. And these highlights should be more on the orange side, and these highlights, while still warmer than the shadow side of the trunk, should not be as warm as the highlights that are in the trees that are closer to you. That's what's gonna push these highlights back. 
Um, so in order to warm these highlights back here, instead of using an a orangish tone like a transparent red oxide, burnt sienna, yellow ochre, or something like that, I'm going to uh, shift toward a cool red, which would be something like alizarin or magenta to give them still some warmth, but not as warm as what's close up. Also, the uh, shadow sides of these trunks, I made them a little cooler than the shadow sides of this trunk, just because, well, they appear that way when I look at them, and that's because they're further away. So that's one of the ways to uh, show depth and distance in your work. Okay, just replenish the few colors here. The beautiful birds singing very close to me. Now at this point, I'm going hardcore impressionistic just by putting in dabs of color. I really just try to look at the whole scene and then capture the impression of what I'm seeing, hence the term impressionism. Now, um, as I move a little closer here to the foreground, actually I'm in the extreme foreground, I'm going to put a little more warmth, a little more orange or cad yellow light, which is a fairly warm yellow. You can see here, this is cad yellow light, that's cad lemon. This one's a cooler yellow. It's lighter, but it's more toward green. This one is a warmer yellow, it has more red in it, or means it, it leans more toward orange. and. Putting that in here in the foreground is going to help give the illusion of depth and keeping, keeping those warm greens out of the background is going to push that further back. I can get a little warm back there, but I'm not, I don't want it as warm as here. So I'm gonna use cadmium lemon to uh, to warm up these greens and shift a little more toward cadmium orange to warm up my foreground greens. It's not always like that. There are times where those rules can be broken and it can look really nice, but overall that's the general idea you want to uh, have. For me, one of the most important things you can show in a landscape painting is the feeling of depth and distance. 
to feel that this is further away than this. And that's accomplished through aerial perspective primarily, you know, also classical perspective, you know, things getting smaller as they recede. But aerial perspective, the concept of things getting cooler and lighter overall as they recede, with some exceptions, um, is the way to accomplish that. I talk about that quite a bit in my classes. And I really hammer that into my students. And once again, I'll say, you know, detail isn't going to give you that. In fact, you want lack of detail, you want less detail as you go further back. And I'll even add a little bit of white to these distant highlights because white is a very cooling agent. It'll help cool down my highlights even more back here. Give my palette a good cleaning there. I do this to create interest and texture in a lot of my uh, plein air stuff. Just a quick scrape with the palette knife when you're dealing with natural um, elements like grass, foliage, things like that. Kind of gives it a bit of an abstract feel. Okay, so just want to make some more adjustments to some of these greens. Um, there's a lot of interesting tonality going on. Just different shifts in color temperature and everything. Also, um, there's shifts in intensity with these greens. I like to try to get those in there. That's the whole reason why I'm out here doing this is to capture those, those little subtleties that you're not going to get from a camera. I really just want to get the feeling of being able to go from here into there. Once again, that feeling of depth and distance. 
it's going to be a very subtle thing. It's going to be captured by just getting that, that shift in tones correct. I notice these grasses actually take on, as they go up right in here, they almost take on a blue tinge. That's something I know I would probably never get from a camera. Hello. First company I had since I started. Wouldn't say company, but person coming by. See, I'm pretty much out of titanium white. Might have to replenish here soon. Uh, here in the foreground, there's some little highlights of dead leaves showing through some of the grassy areas. some cool grasses so I'm adding a little more viridian to this mixture along with some white I'm just mixing that into my already existing grass mixture that I have there and even though cool generally recedes yeah if you see it there in the foreground even though it does slightly violate the uh, principles, angles, and consequent, I'm sorry, not angles and consequent values, but aerial perspective, you can stick that in and, you know, it can work as long as it's not dominating. That can really uh, give your painting some life. And once again, if you're interested in studying under me, um, click on that link below. That'll take you to the uh, sign-up page for the waiting list. Be great to have you there. And um, if you could hit the subscribe button, that would be great. helps me to uh, keep making these.
also um, have uh, quite a few other videos on this channel, which is why it's good to subscribe. I try to put a new one up every week. So far I've been, for quite a while now, I've been keeping up that promise. I might not always be able to. Some weeks I might have to take off for whatever reason, but there are uh, other planar videos I have on this channel, so uh, go check those out when this one's done. If you've hung around this long, you're probably interested um, or you're just uh, fast forwarded to the end to see how this is going to turn out. Hopefully you liked it. And if you did, you can fast forward, you can watch my other videos and fast forward to the end of those too and see if you like those. Okay, we just lost the sun, which is fine because I want to see what this looks like. Right now we have this overcast light, and if this looks convincing under this overcast light, I know it's going to be a good painting, it's, or at least a good study, because it'll look convincing back home in the studio. Sometimes you, know, you think it looks good out in the field and you get back under studio light and you're just like, what the heck was I thinking? Was I painting? Don't know what I was painting, but so far I'm pretty happy with this. So even under the gray light that I'm currently under, it's, uh, I think it's doing all right. I do want to lighten up the ground plane just a little bit, as the great prophet Aretha Franklin once said. As overall, I just I want that value difference between here and here. More and more clouds moving in. It tends to happen in the uh, afternoon. In the morning, you'll have more sunny light, and then in the afternoon, you get some clouds that come in. Now, there's a whole bunch of um, leaves and everything growing off this vine. I'm not going to paint every single one, but I do want to get enough in just to make it interesting.
Let's darken this shadow a little bit more. Some of this might be a little different than the um, reference photo on the side and that's because the shadows keep shifting and while I try not to chase the light too much, um, if I see a more interesting pattern develop that I think is going to make a better painting, then I have no problem chasing things a little bit to get that in there. Okay, like I said, be sure to check out my other videos. Um, if you wait till the end here, you'll see the final painting and you'll see uh, a couple other videos you can click on to go watch if you haven't done so. Or just click on my channel icon below and uh, that will take you there also. Um, of course, I keep thinking I'm done and then I keep seeing a few more things I want to get in. Uh, this is a dangerous stage, you gotta be careful because you, know, you could be out here all day trying to get everything in and then ruin the painting. But I would like to. There's some branches hanging down there. You can give just a little more interest to everything. Uh, and let's do one more thing. I, I know you guys keep thinking, come on, dude, get done, get finished here, but Here's one more thing I want to do. There's um, I was originally gonna do this scene um, Vertically Because I really like the uh, intense sky blue that was shown through the trees, but then I thought the composition might be a little more interesting having to go back like that. But there is some of that intense sky blue that does come down a little bit. I'm gonna try to put some of that in there and see if that looks good or if it wrecks it. That might be just enough to just give it a little extra pop there and a little relief. setting that on top there. I do like that. I don't want to overdo it, but... And maybe a little bit right there.
Okay, now I think I'm done, I promise. 